marketing engineer for open ecosystems for NetApp. So today what we'll be looking at uh, is into the application consistent backup for containerized workloads. So the point here is we have seen uh, con application consistent backup for normal monolithic applications. But the point here is if suppose you have an application like a database inside your Kubernetes cluster, how do we take an application consistent backup there? So that is what we're going to look at. And uh, how many of you work on Kubernetes containers? So don't worry. Um, I'll try to explain it at a very basic level um, on a top-up approach. And uh, let's see if we can get through this. So for the agenda, what we have is let's try to understand what stateful containerization of workload is. Uh, let's try to understand what are the existing data protection technologies that we have. Now, in the first session that we had, I think it was the second session that uh, one of our associates uh, explained about uh, the modern data protection challenges. I, I think that was quite informative. But adding on to that, let's try to understand what are the data protection te technologies that we have for stateful containerization of workloads. Then let's look at the problem statement, looking at the stateful, uh, looking at uh, uh, how application consistent backup is much better than crash consistent backup. And finally, a quick look and into the application consistent backup and restore. And finally, we will uh, dwell into the disaster recovery scenario quickly. Now, I need not explain why we need containers. It has revolutionized the way how we deploy and develop applications. So, Initially, what we had was monolithic applications, which means you had a huge application running on a server. But with the advent of SOA, service oriented architecture, what we have was we had the modules coming up and that extended towards microservices. And the question came, how do we deploy those microservices? The answer to that question was containers. Now, let's just hold on there. Just containers alone to deploy your application will not work. What we need is an orchestrator something to deploy your application to make sure that when your application scales up or scales down, your, uh, there should be an orchestrator to do that. Now that's where Kubernetes comes in, okay? So that is for your information. But with the coming of containers, you know, when you look at the agile methodology, it has increased the efficiency and uh, productivity. When you look, when you normally we have the DevOps being applied in our companies as of now, in all our companies. so when we have a CI CD pi pipeline that is continuous integration and continuous deployment, uh, containers have helped us to automate and optimize. And talking about SaaS applications or cloud native applications, what happens when you really need to, uh, uh, you know, at a particular time when your application needs to scale up or scale down? What is the best way to do that? Elasticity and scalability is what container gives us. And another important thing, portability. Across clouds, from on-prem to cloud, the possibilities are amazing. So why is storage persistent? Well, we all know that containers are ephemeral. Ephemeral means stateless, which means the moment you run your microservice, you run it, and when you shut it down, it goes, all the data goes. So it is very, but, uh, it is very important that you need a storage behind it because your data center applications, your uh, enterprise applications will have data and you have to make sure that data is persistent. So you need, you need to have a container and you need to have storage behind it. Now, the 12 factor methodology, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you, you have seen this. This is a good read for people who are into uh, SaaS applications. Uh, this is basically a gu guideline to kind of uh, tell us how to, uh, how to develop a SaaS application. Now, there are about 12 points there which are very informative, but in one of, the, those, uh, in one of those methodologies, it, cl it clearly states that uh, your microservice should be stateless. And moreover, whatever data that is being produced, we have to make sure that it should be backed up using a backing service, which means a database. So if you you need to have a storage behind it.
Now, if you look at the uh, applications, many applications running, most of them are containerized. Now, if you look at uh, web servers or proxies or application code, those don't need data behind it. I'm sorry, those don't need storage behind it. It can just run on, run on its own. But when you're looking at CDNs, databases, these are stateful, which means if you run a MongoDB or MySQL as a container, you would need a data, uh, you need to have a storage that is persistent behind. Now, I went through why containers and why we need storage behind containers. Now, the most challenging part of having this is, uh, it is very difficult to kind of have containers with storage along with it. What I mean is when your storage, uh, when your container spawn by itself, when it scales up or scales down, how do you kind of make storage dynamically come behind it? As in to say, let's say that you have an application that is running and at a particular time, your peak time, uh, your microservices will spawn automatically by Kubernetes and you need to have, you need to have storage behind it. So how does, how does that happen? The answer to that question is the container storage plugin, okay? Uh, all storage vendors have their own container storage plugin. Uh, for NetApp, it's called Trident. What Trident does is it automatically, depending upon the persistent volume claim uh, given by the user, Trident will detect that and make sure that you kind of go ahead and create the volume and bring it to the orchestrator of choice. So Trident has uh, integration with many orchestrators. Trident is basically an open source and uh, it is cross-platform as well. So just like Trident, uh, there is uh, Dell Rexray, HDS storage plugin, Pure Storage Orchestrator and New New uh, Nutanix storage plugin as well as IBM Dory. So these are the different container storage plugins. So in short, what do they do? They dynamically provision volume on Kubernetes and gives it as a persistent volume to the application. Now, let's look at the data protection uh, solutions for the containerized workload. I just want to reiterate that, containerized workloads. So I'm going to present you here about a set of four solutions that we have as of now. And uh, we will look into each one of them and uh, discuss them. So the first one solution, as a part of solution one, I have something, uh, it is the storage cont container plugin snapshots. So which means that, uh, as I just stated before, every vendor has, every storage vendor has their own storage container plugin. Now, what will happen here is when these have snapshotting, snapshotting embedded within the, uh, themselves. What I mean to say that is when you, when you automatically provision volume, when you automatically provision volume, it is actually kind of put along with a snapshot policy. So when, when, it, when it has a snapshot policy along with it, it creates snapshot policy according to the, according to the schedule. Now how, do we, now, how do you go ahead and uh, create snapshot policy? It can be done during uh, creating a PVC or a storage class as well. So please remember the snapshotting hap happens on the storage side, not on the application perspective. So, uh, so and, and, these, and these snapshots are crash consistent backups. Yeah. Yeah, for cataloging, you would need another backup orchestrator externally. Yeah. So, sorry? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Array side, no cataloging will be there. No. So, uh, solution two. Now, solution two is an extension of the previous point that I said, that is, uh, storage container plugin with the CSA standard. Now, CSA standard is uh, known as Container Storage Interface Standard. It is a standard brought about by the CNCF to make sure that your plugin, that the storage, storage vendor uh, container plugin can talk to any of the orchestrators. For example, if you write a storage, uh, storage container plugin, uh, you might need to write it for Kubernetes, Mesos, and Cloud Foundry. But if you follow the CSI spec, specification, uh, your storage container plugin can talk to all of the orchestrators. So with the CSI, with the advent of CSI, 
uh, starting from Kubernetes 1.12 version. This is an alpha feature. So we can use, just like we use persistent volume and persistent volume claim. These are APIs that we use in Kubernetes to kind of get a volume. Similarly, you can use volume snapshot content and volume snapshot API as well to go ahead and take a snapshot. So uh, in point number one, I said you have to go to the storage array to go ahead and take a snapshot. But here you can use the Kubernetes API to go ahead and take the snapshot on an application level. Yes, it will call the external snapshot, uh, snapshot that each vendor has written. No, no, this is a standard. So these are standard and each storage vendor would have to create their own APIs. I mean, this APIs is a standard. So the behind how it, the provisioner should be written by the storage, by the storage vendors. Thirdly, open source tools. So we have certain uh, tools like Heptio Arc, Valero, and uh, Cube, Cube Backup. These are, uh, these again are tools that uh, help you take backup of both the cube cluster as well as, as well as the persistent volume. So these generally kind of can be installed as a CRD uh, that is content resource descriptors. And uh, there is a backup controller. The backup controller will look for the user's request for a backup. As soon as it uh, identifies one, it will take the backup of the cube as well as for the persistent volume. And then it will call the object storage service to upload, uh, to upload the backup file to the cloud provider of your choice. So this is another set of tools that we have for backup. Um, again, iterating the name, uh, Heptio Arc and Valero are a few of them. So solution one, two, and three, they are all crash consistent backup. Now let's try to understand what they are after this uh, solution four. So third party solutions. So we have Com, Comvault, Veeam, et cetera. They also do uh, backup as well. But as of now, they do kind of uh, backup of um, they do the backup of container, uh, Docker containers and Docker images. They make it into a tar and give it into the uh, media agent. If you want to restore it, they'll have to go to the media agent, take the tar and then kind of deploy it onto the Docker host. So all the solutions that I've mentioned are basically a crash consistent backup. Now you might be asking what is cr crash consistent backup? Now that takes us to the problem statement, okay? Uh, the crash consistent backup and restore. So what is the problem with crash consistent backup? Uh, it does not capture any data in memory or pending IO operations, which means if you have a database, you cannot just go take a snapshot on the storage side. If you have, uh, it, for example, if you have an Oracle or a MySQL or any database, you have to quiesce the database, then go take the snapshot, then come back and unquiesce the application. Then only will you have, uh, uh, then only will you have a consistent uh, database. So the backup when you take crash consistent backup will not have any data in memory or IO operations. And while restoring what will happen is uh, you have to do a journaling for forward. Just applying the snapshot will not help you there. You have to journal forward the particular database and bring it forward. So the question comes, how do we take an application consistent backup? How do we take an application consistent restore? and uh, what happens in a disaster recovery scenario. Now, now that is what we'll be looking into. So let's uh, see how application consistent backup and restore works. So when you talk about application consistent backup, there are two layers basically. You have the application layer and you have the storage layer. So if you need to take a backup, what you would need to do is you would need to quiesce the application. Then go to the storage layer, take a snapshot, come back to the application layer, and then unquiesce it. So then the, then the IO will start happening to the database as required. How about what, so let's look what happens in restore. In restore, what you have to do is you have to select a snapshot of choice, apply the snapshot on the storage, come to the database, come, come to your application, and then make sure that you run the recovery operations. So these are the basic things. Now, I presume that everybody knows this who are in the backup and uh, recovery domain, but the problem is what do you do in a containerized uh, uh, workload? What do you, 
how do you do it how do you do this for the continuous workload that's the question okay so before we get into the uh, a quick look on to the methodology uh, a few com co components that we need to kind of understand we need to understand what a backup orchestrator is here the backup orchestrator is nothing that take the takes a snapshot on the storage it does the metadata handling and it and it sets up the kubernetes backup and recovery plugin the Kubernetes backup plugin is a deployment that runs on its own in its own namespace. Then you have two other entities that are spawned by the Kubernetes backup plugin. They are the DB specific backup and restore plugin and uh, DB specific restore plugin. So these are the two uh, four main components that we need to kind of keep this in mind. Now let's go ahead and uh, see how this works. So just to explain what is going on here, on the left, you have a three node uh, Kubernetes cluster with the master and two minions. In that particular application, you have a MySQL as well as uh, Oracle application running in its own namespace. Uh, don't, get, uh, don't worry about too much of terminologies. Uh, it's, I'll try to make it as simple as possible so that you can follow it. And then Trident is the one that gives you, that dynamically provisions volume onto the My, uh, MySQL, uh, for the MySQL database and the Oracle uh, database. And this is the storage from which the volumes are uh, provisioned from. So, so now we are going to look the discover methodology. Now the first thing is, we are kind of trying to discover what is there in the Kubernetes cluster. So for that, what you need to do is, you need to add the Kubernetes cluster to the backup orchestrator. So when you add, you give the IP of the master and then backup orchestrator, what it does is it deploys a Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin into the Kubernetes cluster in its own namespace, right? So now what it does is the Kubernetes plugin will go ahead and discover the cluster. It will go ahead and see, hey, what are the namespaces that we have? What are the pods that are running? What are the application, what are the IP certificates, everything it will go ahead and discover. And, uh, and the Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin will have a REST interface. So what ideally would happen is the backup orchestrator would ping the uh, Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin, take the data and populate it here. So how, how would that look like? So let's suppose you click on add so it'll ask you, would you like to add the Kubernetes cluster or the open uh, or the OpenShift cluster? Sorry? No, this is an internal tool that we have. It is, yeah, yeah. So it'll ask you for the, uh, it'll ask you for the cluster details. And then you have to uh, finish off with the uh, adding the cluster, Kubernetes cluster, after which what will happen is it'll discover all the pod names, namespaces, mount paths, the volume that you that you have so this has some interaction with the trident as well so this is how the basic discovery we've not gone into backup this is how the uh, the backup orchestrator with the help of the plugin will go and discover the kubernetes cluster and bring in details the pods yeah the language in kubernetes would be different so you have pods you have uh, even pods can have multiple containers so what are those? So it'll kind of completely de deconstruct everything and uh, feed it to the backup orchestrator. Now to start off with the backup methodology, uh, if suppose you would like to do an on-demand backup or you would like, or, or a scheduled backup request, the backup request would come from the backup orchestrator. It will go down to the Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin. So the, for, when, when the request is sent to the Kubernetes uh, backup and recovery plugin, uh, the de details of the pod, the nature of the application, the IP, everything is sent to the uh, plugin. So what happens next is the Kubernetes uh, backup and recovery plugin will deploy the application specific backup plugin. So you can see that the MySQL, I'll just go back again. You can see that the MySQL backup plugin is deployed in that particular namespace. So uh, it can talk to the, uh, to the MySQL database. The next thing it will do is the database will be quiesced, which means the IO will stop there, but the redo logs will get populated. 
Then an information is sent back to the, uh, to the backup orchestrator. And backup orchestrator will go ahead and take the back snapshot of all the volumes. So normally the best practice is if you have an Oracle volume, you need to keep the data files in one volume, you need to keep the archive logs in one volume, you have to keep the read logs in another volume. So, so you will have set of volumes. So if you have more than one volume to take backup for, uh, the backup orchestrator will make sure that it will take the backup in that consistency group. And then after the backup is completed, the, the data is un unquiesced. And next thing is to remove the backup plugin. It will go ahead and automatically remove the backup plugin. So you, you will have a choice whether to keep the backup plugin there, but ideally it is best to remove it because uh, it will not consume any resource. Yeah, while installing, you can have the backup. So you, you can configure the, the Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin with the specific options that you would like, would like to keep it or not. So it'll, it'll run as a deployment. You can send the API. I mean, there's a Python program to kind of use the Kube APIs to, to run the deployment. Sorry? No, it has to be. So that is the basic preliminary thing. It has to be. So that, that, that's, what, uh, that's what Trident does. So, we, so that's why I kind of made sure that Trident came there to make sure that they are in the volumes provisioned by. I, uh, I, I didn't completely understand, uh, I, I did partially understand the problem, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll quick touch base on that. So what will happen is here, you will go ahead and uh, click on the uh, pod and the, uh, the pod name that you would like, and it'll ask you for its confirmation. And then what will happen here is it will go ahead and take the backup. So here you can see uh, it will quiz the application it will create the snapshot, it will unquest the application, it will get the snapshot details, and then a series of things will follow through. And as you can see here, you can see that uh, the snapshot name, the start date, everything has been collected here as well. So this is, way, uh, this is how the backup methodology works, but uh, let's quickly see how the restore methodology works as well. The backup orchestrator. Yeah, the backup orchestrator. Yeah, I mean, so I wanted to make it very generic. So uh, rather than product specific, I wanted to make so that that's why I kind of earlier mentioned that it is the one who takes snapshots, handles metadata. So uh, the restore methodology again, uh, the you have the Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin here. So before you do. Uh, restore, what we would need to do is we would need to choose a snapshot for restore and then backup orchestrator will request to a restore to the Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin. So the moment you send a request there, the Kubernetes backup and recovery plugin will go to the repository and pull, will uh, set up a deployment for a MySQL restore plugin. Okay, A MySQL restore plugin com comes in there. Once that is deployed, the backup orchestrator will be updated and the snapshot will be restored on all the volumes or the consistency group. And then it will check if it is live again and it will run the recovery procedures. And after which the restore is completed, the restore plugin will be cleaned up again. So this is how the basic restore plugin again works. So here, if you look at it, you, uh, you will have, uh, you can choose a snapshot here and uh, click on restore. It will ask you for the confirmation and it will go ahead and uh, do the restore. I couldn't get all the details there, so but it will uh, list out the steps there. So this, this is how the discover the backup and the restore works. And let's quickly look at the disaster recovery scenario. So here, uh, 
let's say that you have site A and site B where you have your Kubernetes cluster running with the application and all the volumes, even the ETCD volumes, uh, your MySQL volumes, Oracle volumes and your repository as well are backed up onto uh, the storage, storage volumes. And this storage volume from the source cluster is mirrored to the destination, to, to a destination volume there, uh, the destination cluster which has, which is snap mirrored async or uh, synchronous snap mirror that is happening between them. And application consistent backups are taken regularly on site A. Now what will happen is in the event of a disaster, if site A should completely go down, it will make sure that the snap mirror is broken. That is the snap mirror relationship is broken completely and the volumes on the destination side are made available. So you will have the ETCD volume available, you will have the MySQL volume available, you will have the Oracle volume available and the repository as well. And then what would happen is probably using a set of Ansible scripts, you can bring back the deployments using the backend, using the backend uh, uh, volumes as well and you can bring it up. Now the question uh, comes, how do we go ahead and do the restore here? Now, as I said, Kubernetes plugin will have a REST API. So you can choose, you can send the API through an uh, automation or scripts to make sure that, hey, I need this is this pod, this volume, uh, and uh, this. So that will be a manual process, but bringing up the Kubernetes on the site B would require a set of automations there. So that's pretty much it that I have. And uh, the, uh, just to sum up that uh, what we've looked into, we have looked into the existing uh, backup technologies, four of them in summarize. We summarized all uh, four of them and what they are. We looked into what application consistent backup actually means for a containerized workload, okay? And how do we do uh, application consistent backup and restore? And finally, we looked quickly into the disaster recovery scenario. So, uh, yeah, so this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Yes. associated in order to recover your uh, containers? So the, uh, are you talking about the uh, recovery time objective? Yeah. And yeah. The... So in a disaster, I'll already have a Kubernetes cluster there. Uh, how soon can I recover the data from the volumes that I've replicated? So there are two points, recovery point objective and recovery time objective. I think recovery point objective is to what level you want to restore and recovery time objective is in what time can you go ahead and restore. So RPO, I think fairly it will be handled to the latest snapshot, but RTO, uh, it can never be zero. It will have some because it will, it will involve some automation on the, uh, on the secondary side. So RTO will not, cannot be guaranteed at zero for sure, but it can be uh, using the automation that you have, you can bring it up as soon as possible. So thank you, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it, thank you so much.